the day. We are bringing a little bit of science and a lot of wisdom and expertise to the Everyday Mindfulness Show. I am so excited to bring to the show Dawson Church, PhD. He is the author of several books on science, science in the brain, epigenetics. Today we're going to focus in on his newest book. It's called Mind to Matter, The Astonishing Science of How Your Brain Creates Your Material Reality. Dawson, thank you for your yes to coming on the show. Holly, I'm looking forward to being here and sharing. So thanks for having me. Well, I'm really honored that you came on the show because so much of your work scientifically demonstrates what we are talking about every single week on the show. And I often come up against skeptics, people that say, I'm not willing to meditate, it doesn't work for me. And yet you have many scientific case studies, healing stories of people who are given this a try that we'd love to share. And I always like to start with our guests on your own personal story. How did you come to find your passion in brain science and mindfulness? Well, I was one of those people, Holly, who was a skeptic who said meditation doesn't work for me. And I had evidence to prove it because when I was 15 years old, I was really uh, in, in a lot of distress, suffering a lot. I was anxious. I, I, had, I was very depressed. Uh, I had what I now realize was PTSD from my early childhood. And one of the events that really I remember clearly from being 15 was one day I was with a group of friends in a hotel and it had full length mirrors, these big mirrors in the lobby of the hotel. I walked past the mirror and I turned and stared at myself, my own reflection. And uh, back then as a hippie, I had very long hair and I was wearing a, a weird plaid shirt and I had a mad purse over my shoulder and <laughs> bell bottom trousers. I looked, I looked uh -huh. in, 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 the, in, the, in the mirror there and I looked at my own face and I said to myself, that is the saddest face I've ever seen. I realized there was just, just, I was just hopelessly in despair about ever having a decent life or a corner of my mind that wasn't tormented with fear and worry and, and all of those kinds of negative thoughts that bombard us all. So I, I joined the spiritual community and I lived on an ashram for a while, on and off for quite a few years. And even when I was, was not on the ashram, I was, I was visiting it often. And so for a long time, like 15 years or so, very, very involved in spirituality, also in psychology taking classes in gestalt therapy and cognitive therapy, trying to fix my own suffering and making progress. I got better and better and better. Little by little, it, 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 it seemed to work. But then around 2000, I really got into energy psychology and energy medicine in a big way. And I made the commitment in 2002, when I was again going through a very, very rough patch in my life, I made the commitment to meditating every single day day. It was like, no excuses. Even though I've been so unsuccessful my whole life, I'm just going to do this. I'm going to make a commitment. So I had two young kids at the time, and they had to be up at 6.30 a.m. So to meditate, I had to get up at 5.30 a.m. And that, to me, is a horrible hour. Well, it was back then. Now I get up at 5 a.m. naturally, even 4.30 some mornings. And back then, it was like painful for me to <laughs> imagine getting up at 5.30 a.m. But I just did. I just made that decision. I, I did and my entire life began to change for the better. I'd been on this kind of hamster wheel of the same old agony in money and relationships and health all, all, you know, for, for decades. And suddenly the hamster wheel was gone and I began to, to shift. So I then, became, I then became fascinated by science and I wanted to teach people a way to meditate that was easy because the instructions I got from in, the, in, the, in the ashram from the spiritual teacher were sit down, be still, close your eyes and still your mind. Now, yeah. you can't still your mind. The mind is in design to be hyper aware of everything going on around us. In fact, when we close our eyes, it, our brain activity doesn't stop at all. It just ratchets up to think about imaginary <laughs> things because it doesn't see anything real. The visual cortex in the back of the skull here goes offline. So the default mode network kicks in. And the default mode network of the brain is one big plexus right over here, the mid prefrontal cortex and the posterior cingulate cortex back here, the default mode network has one job, and that is to keep you safe. And so it just recycles memories of anything bad from the past and anything that might be bad in the future. The tiger that 
almost 80 years today, the tiger that might eat you tomorrow. And the default mode network, when you close your eyes and don't do anything active, it kicks on and it floods your mind with the bad stuff of your past and the fears from the future. And so that's why people can't meditate. So I set out to find a way, way to scientifically silence the default network and give people a sense of inner peace. And I found that there were seven very simple steps you could take that deep meditation produces that you could do. And there's breathing a certain way, relaxing a certain muscle. They're, they're not hard to do. And so now we're getting literally thousands of reports in from people who are doing those seven simple steps and saying, for the first time in my life, I can meditate. And I did it the very first time I tried this method called eco meditation. So that's what I'm doing now. I'm researching, I'm doing MRI research, EEG research, hormone research on these energy methods that are super simple, that really work and that move the needle. Well, that's so inspiring because so many people do come to me and they say, you know, I'm not even gonna, gonna try to meditate. And I, I often joke, okay, let's, let's, you know, Thank your monkey mind for showing up. Give it a cookie, put it on the shelf, and let's let's try, try, and try, and try again. And I think it's exciting to me to know that science is supporting this idea that with the the immense amount of infobesity of technology of social media that's all coming upon us, that maybe some of these people really are right. They they can't meditate, and that's why I like to say it's a for me. We have to. I kind of bucket mindfulness in one bucket and meditation in another to invite people to find other ways to infuse mindfulness. So uh, we can use our meditation practices, grow them, but in the interim also support ourselves with other brain activity that might allow us to be more present in the moment and utilize these techniques to connect better to one another. Yeah, because it's one thing to go away on, on a meditation retreat and spend a week or a month or Buddhists go there for three years sometimes um, outside of the world. But what really counts is what happens when you get back into the world. And so in EEG research, we have uh, several things we measure. One is EO, one is EC, eyes closed, eyes open. And so it, even if you are an experienced meditator and you close your eyes and you can get, reach a deep state in that in that. In, in your practice. When you open your eyes, the big question is, can you sustain it? And that is, do you have emotional regulation in everyday life? And if you have emotional regulation, then when somebody cuts you off in traffic, you don't scream and yell and give them the finger. When you have emotional regulation and your kid does badly in school, you don't scream and yell and tear up the report card. When your partner says something annoying, you don't blurt out a, a sentence that's gonna destroy your marriage. So I mean, or having emotional regulation is absolutely critical to happy happiness is the single skill most likely to make you happy is the ability to self-regulate your own emotions. And so um, in chapter one of my book, Mind to Matter, I give you a case history of a man called Graham Phillips. And even though the book has over 400 scientific studies that describes, I often illustrate them with a story of one person. So it'll be a study of you know, 1,600 people, but then I'll tell the story of one because that one story really encapsulates all the learning of that science. And so Graham Phillips had been reading about mindfulness and meditation. He was a TV anchor man, TV personality, had his own show called Catalyst on the Australian Broadcasting Network. And he said, I'm going to look into this. I'm a skeptic, but I'm going to look into this, this mindfulness meditation thing because I've read studies showing it has big effects on your health. So he went with his, his whole camera crew and team into a really advanced imaging laboratory at Monash University, where they gave, gave him a high resolution MRI scans and also tested all kinds of cognitive functions and, and biological and physical functions. And they then got, had a whole profile of his brain function and body function. He then spent eight weeks being mindful and meditating. And after just two weeks, he noticed big behavioral changes. He was no longer screaming and yelling at people. He was no longer impatient with his team members. And then after eight weeks, now this is just two months, okay, eight weeks, he went back to Monash. They gave him another complete analysis of his brain and function and body. And they found that parts of his brain had grown in that time by 2%. 3%, 4%, the happiness parts of the brain, the brains that are active in, the parts of the brain active in happy people. 
But the emotional regulation network is a little node in thin layer of tissue in the very center of our brain that has tentacles that go out and control all kinds of other parts of our brain. That's called the dentate gyrus. And that is the core, the hub of emotional regulation in our brain. His dentate gyrus in that eight weeks grew by 22.8%, okay? That is like a quarter increased growth in only eight weeks. So what's happening is we're doing these practices. We're doing these things that look like they are pretty insubstantial. They're states of mind, states of consciousness. What we don't realize is they're producing hormone changes. They're producing enzyme changes. They're, they are producing gene changes. They are producing, I just published a study on things called microRNAs. They're producing microRNA changes. They are literally remodeling your brain and they're not doing it over just over 10, 20 years or 10,000 hours or 50,000 hours. They are doing it in the first eight weeks of mindfulness and not a little bit, 22.8% growth in this highly beneficial brain area. And that's just one of the case histories. That's from chapter one of Mind to Matter. So you, you, you definitely want to apply this in your life because it can make a huge difference all throughout the, every, every part of your outer life. Obviously, I'm, I'm a, a meditator, a mindfulness person, but, you know, but I hear from people all the time, Holly, I just don't have time. I can't, I can't find the time. I can't make the time. It doesn't work for me. I love that concept of remodeling your brain. And yet some of these things, Dr. Church, they really feel like, oh, it's just the magic panacea of all things. I'm not even going to try because it's just like this magic wand. It, what, what would you tell those people about how to look at just trying it and doing some observations kind of on their own self to get that skeptic to just give it a shot? Yeah, well, um, here is some of the research. Um, and again, there are over 400 studies in Mind to Matter, but I simplify them and explain them in, in, in clear ways. So among the many health benefits of meditation are increased stem cell activity. And so different frequencies you generate in meditation are able to literally make your stem cells proliferate. And your stem cells keep you young. Your stem cells repair damaged tissue. It lowers inflammation. It also promotes the expression of genes, like in one meditation study, it produced, it produced, it produced the, the upregulation of a whole group of beneficial genes. And so it's doing all these things for your, your wellness. It's affecting your longevity. People who meditate have longer telomeres. And the amount of time it takes is really short. The world's biggest meditation app is called Insight Timer. And I'm one of the teachers there. My, um, my meditations in the last year have had close to 100,000 plays. And my meditations on Insight Timer are 15 minutes or less. And you definitely have 15 minutes. Everyone has that, that at, at the, start, the start of their day. And if you do it, if you do that, and if you meditate effectively in that way, then you start to see these epigenetic changes and these brainwave changes in your body. How big are they? I'll tell you the story of one person who did this. And she's actually a friend of mine. Her name is Beth Meisner. She's come up with a book now about her, her experiences. So that's why I can share this publicly. But she was diagnosed with metastasized breast cancer. And she had a large tumor two inches across in the center of her right breast. And so when the doctors found this large tumor, they said, well, let's see if it's spread. They then found um, that all the lymph nodes under her right armpit were swollen, inflamed, full of cancer cells. They also found three spots of inflammation on her right lung. So it looked like the cancer was spreading throughout her body. And the oncologist who gave her the diagnosis said, Beth, normally we want to put you on a course of chemotherapy and radiation. I want you to go straight from my office today to radiology to get your first treatment. It's that serious. And Beth, to her credit, said no. I need time to think. I need time to plan. I need time to weigh the alternatives. I need to get a second and a third opinion. And the oncologist, bless her heart, said, I'm totally here for you if you need me. And I totally respect your decision. I'm going to support you with whatever you do. And so Beth then completely changed her life from that day onward. She quit watching the news. She unplugged from all of her, her alerts. She quit work. She only focused on her and healing herself. She phoned me, she emailed me and said, Dawson, I've had a gene test. 
I have eight abnormal genes that predispose me to breast cancer. I said to her, Beth, you have 24,000 genes in every cell in your body, which means you have 23,992 that are just perfect. Let's work with those. Forget about the eight ones that, that, that are defective. And so she, uh, she began to do all the Reiki, energy healing, Qigong. She did this intensive work on herself and we did EFT tapping, an acupressure based method I talk about in, in Mind to Matter. And so she did all of these things, went back to that cancer clinic in eight weeks, eight weeks of changing her energy and all the lymph nodes under her right breast were clear and the tumor had shrunk to about a half an inch. Now the oncologist said, well, let's just schedule surgery and cut it out. And Beth is like, no, I don't think so. This is working really well for me, changing my energy. It's changing the matter of my body. And so there are literally dozens of stories in mind to matter of people who change their health, change their money, change their relationship path, change their health, change, change their weight, change all kinds of external things in their lives as a result of changing their energy and their consciousness. Energy is where it all begins. Energy, Einstein said, the sole governing factor of the, the particle is the field. You wanna change your energy field. And when you do that, the matter of your body starts to improve, the matter of your life starts to improve and you literally affect the world around you in a direct way. I love what you're saying and what's, both exciting and sometimes terrifying for people who as, they, as we embark upon this work is we have to own our own empowerment mm -hmm. that that woman's story is just such a great example of that this is this is not a science that you can just go read a book and then suddenly you know you pop the pill and and it, and, it, and it happens for you and a lot of folks that are just now coming across these sciences and the researchers and, and books like yours they, they might start with something in the world of affirmations or intentions. You've talked a little hints about tapping and those types of things. Help us understand how those little introductory tools may help us to create these bigger results like you just shared. Those little introductory tools are what you do to shift yourself when you're under stress. So meditation is like, the foundation. Meditation is the baseline. And in Mind to Matter, I talk about 30 or so practices you can use. And some of them are very simple. Time in nature is one of them. Grounding is another one of them. Uh, movement meditations like yoga and qigong are a third. There are lots and lots and lots of these possibilities. But the two that I think are absolutely essential for everyone, without exception, are meditation, number one, and tapping, number two. And tapping is just tapping on 13 acupressure points like this to your fingertips, but it regulates the energy flows in your body. And there are over 100 clinical trials of the method showing that it works dramatically for weight loss, for anxiety, for depression, for PTSD, for phobias, and for autoimmune diseases. And so um, you want to have at least those two. They can really make a difference in your life and not a subtle difference, not, not a small difference. Here are some numbers from a study we did of people who did a one week retreat where they were meditating with me in the morning and they were tapping all through the day, tapping on their traumas, tapping on their, on their childhoods, tapping on their disappointments. So we measured things like their blood pressure and heart rate and heart rate variability and their immunoglobulins, because immunoglobulins are in your saliva and they're a marker of how well your immune system is, is working. We measured their cortisol, which is the, the, the baseline marker of your stress level. And we found that Holly, over a course of just one week, that their anxiety and depression dropped dramatically, their happiness increased, and their cortisol went down by an average of 37%. Now that's a massive drop in, in, um, in cortisol. The lab I work with says that you hardly ever see such a big drop in cortisol unless somebody is working intensively on stress reduction for about six months. But in just one week, massive drop in cortisol, and then their immunoglobulins rose 100 and 13% in just that one week. These are, again, huge changes. And that cumulatively means a much longer life and a much healthier life. So um, again, the evidence is just so overwhelming at this point that it doesn't take a lot of time 
but you need to reduce your stress. You need that 15 minutes, 20 minutes of meditation in the morning. And I encourage you to start small there. Make sure though, it's an effective meditation. If you don't, you, you can close your eyes and nothing can be happening other than you're just rehearsing stuff from your past, your future with that default mode network kicked in. That kind of meditation doesn't benefit you, even harm you by just reminding you of what didn't work in the past, but won't work in the future. So uh, you wanna use a guided meditation initially. Use the Muse headband, which can be useful. Use the heart rate variability monitor. There are some smartphone apps to do that. Use something to, to, to train yourself initially into getting into those deep meditative states. After uh, six months or a year or three years, you won't need those, those aids, but, yeah, but use them initially. Use a guided meditation to start with until you can meditate and drop into those deep states without your aid. aid. And then what happens is that you start the day that way, you get to work and one of your colleagues says something that really upsets you or you have a problem client or a project is not going well, what do you do? You don't feel so good anymore. That's when you tap. And the tapping regulates you in under two minutes, very, very quickly gets you back into feeling good. So those are the two essential practices that everybody has that 15 minutes in the morning, everybody can spend two minutes when you're, when you're stressed. And if you don't do that, you have cortisol running in your life, stress and stress hormones, adrenaline, cortisol running in your life all the time. Most people have high levels of those. And if you don't reduce them, they lead over time to they have cancer, heart disease, uh, obesity, cortisol and obesity are very, very highly linked to depression, to loss of skin elasticity, AKA wrinkling, uh, loss of bone density, loss of muscle mass. All of these things are the sequel to high cortisol over time. You, you need to love yourself enough to take, bring your stress down with these two methods, but make sure you use an effective meditation method because again, there are ones that are super effective and will really get you into that deep state Others, you're closing your eyes, the default mode network clicks in, the prefrontal cortex turns on, the posterior cingulate cortex turns on, and you're just rehearsing bad stuff from the past and projecting it into the future, and you're not getting any benefit from having your eyes closed. So that's why initially it's important to use that guided meditation. Well, I'm excited to partner people with like you and continue to change the narrative. Because I think, unfortunately, a lot of folks are coming to this science from a reactive point of view. Something bad has happened in my body and I mm. now have to, to react and respond. Versus, I would love to see our, our industry change the narrative to being more preventative. That I, your use of the word, love yourself enough. Like, let's, let's change the narrative from... I have a problem, I have to fix it, to let's prevent the stress in the first place and support our own brain awareness that rewards chaos and stress. You've seen it, you, you know, you go to a party, you go to an event, oh, I'm so busy, oh yeah, me too, and we go in this downward stress cycle, that how can we as an industry start to support the opposite of that and celebrate the, wow, I had a really relaxing day today. I had a really calm day today. I was really centered and rewarding those behaviors that can really transform our, our world, our industries and the lives that we hope to live. Well, I've written two books on PTSD and what research shows about PTSD is that you can't jump over your past. Uh, in the spiritual community I was in when I was 15 years old, they taught that you could. They said, you just transcend your past and then you you join with the universe. And in mind to matter, I call it non-local mind. Some people call it infinite mind or God or, or a higher power or wh whatever they name label you give it, but it's something more than yourself. It's, a, it's an information field beyond yourself and you, you, can, you can connect with it. But that teaching that you can transcend your past, research shows doesn't work. If you try and ignore your past, it becomes the shadow. So you have to go in and you have to work with the shadow and release the shadow. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because there are two ways to use these tools, like eco-meditation, like EFT tapping. And one way is reactively. And so I think teach a lot of live workshops all over the world. And one of the things I have people do is look at their childhood and actually bring lists of incidents from their childhood that damaged them 
hurt them, traumatize them. So they work on those incidents in those live workshops. One, off, one by one, they work down their list of, of incidents and eventually they're fine. They will work on uh, a, a terrible, say, event where they were bullied or hurt or, or molested and, and they, they're able to, 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 to move through those events. It was powerful when I had one sexual abuse survivor stand up and turn to the whole class at a workshop and say, nothing that man did to me could take away my joy. I was joyful then. Under the surface, I'm joyful now. And um, I, I, I'm now, I'm strong. And so she turned her whole narrative around. Powerful to hear people do that. So that's going in and working on your, your, your stuff from your past. And then you're clearing all of that. Now, at a certain point, you've done enough inner work, you've tapped on a bunch of things, you've had, got a meditation practice going. Now, you're much more able to handle stress in the present. So you're no longer triggered by your past. I know, for example, before this, I learned all this stuff. I was very triggered when people didn't listen to me. And so my wife wouldn't listen to me or uh, a, a, a colleague wasn't listening to me. And I would get very, very upset and agitated. It had nothing to do with my wife or the colleague and had everything to do with not being heard when I was two or three or four. So you want to go and clear all that stuff. Then when the person doesn't hear you in the present, you're no longer reactive to them. And so that's this big component of reparenting ourselves. And in Mind to Matter, in my other books, I talk a lot about the me mechanisms of doing this, what we, the tools we use to do this, what's effective, what science is based, and what works. But then, you want to go about creating a wonderful vision for your life in the future. Like my wife and I lead what's called the Life Vision Retreat for people. In seven days, we, we have them really tune in to what they're being called to do. And we don't have them do that from the level of local mind. Because I look around me and say, my car's broken, I need a, a, a better car. My uh, marriage is, sucks, I need, a, I need to get divorced and find someone else. I don't like where I'm living, I'm going I'm to move. That's all goal set at the level of local mind. What we want you to do, what we guide you to do at the Life Vision Retreat, is we want you to merge with non-local mind. That's where the magic is. That's where the vision is. And so we have people do these practices. And what happens is that when people are in tune with non-local mind, their brain activity changes. So that prefrontal cortex, that mid-prefrontal cortex, goes offline. The temporal parietal junction and the parietal lobe, which governs our sense of space and time, goes offline. We have huge surges of hormones like oxytocin, the bonding hormone, cut flowing through our bodies. So now I'm feeling love and bonding, but this, the part of my brain that constructs the self is shut down, so I'm not bonding with myself. And the parietal lobe, which governs awareness of space and time, has shut down. I'm now literally, as far as my brain can tell, I am one with everything. And that's one of the five fundamental characteristics I talk about in Mind to Matter are people having these transcendent experiences. When you're then in touch with non-local mind, you then, as you're trained to do this, you download the vision that non-local mind has of your perfect life and your perfect goals. And those become your goals in your life vision for the coming year and the rest of your life. And so you're constantly referencing these parts of the universe. You're tuning into the universe as a whole, feeling the love, the wisdom, the intelligence, the, the compassion, the kindness, the beauty, the creativity, the inspiration. And so you've, 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 you've been in this absolutely inspired state for your 15 minutes or 20 minutes or half hour meditation. Now you bring it into reality. And here's the cool thing. Research shows, Holly, that person, you, you know, you think this person is a space cadet walking through life now. How can they pay the bills? How can they be effective on a team? It turns out that they are effective. A study, a 10-year study by the McKinsey Consultancy of highly productive people show that in these flow states of consciousness, when they, when they then move in, walk into their office or, or fire up their computer and they start work, in those states, they are five times more productive. In other words, 
their productivity has increased by 500%. Another study by the Defense Research Agency of people asked to solve very difficult problems. And of course, we have difficult problems in our lives and as a species right now. This DARPA study found that people, when they're in these states, their ability to solve complex problems increases by 490% and their creativity doubles. So now you are in a space case walking around you know, with, with, in, in non-local mind, totally unable to make a ham sandwich. <laughs> you are a 